Welcome back. This video is going to be breaking down the basal urations. We'll be pulling from all of the most up-to-date, peer-reviewed research. It's all linked down in the description. So let's get into it. Basal Eurasians were an early offshoot of modern humans, essentially a ghost lineage inferred from the DNA, not yet identified in any specific fossils. No direct DNA extraction of these people, nothing like what we saw with the Takakori people in North Africa, or the ANE over in China. The concept was introduced by geneticist Iosif Lazaridis and colleagues in 2014, who found that early European farmers carried about 44% of their ancestry from a mysterious non-African source that they dubbed Basal Eurasians. This group is hypothesized to have split off from all other non-African humans shortly after the out-of-Africa migration, but before the rest of those humans interbred with Neanderthals. So in other words, basal Eurasians represent a sister branch to all other Eurasians. All the Eurasians don't come from them, they come from this same group and split off from that same base. They're a population that left Africa early, around 60,000 to 100,000 years ago, and then remained isolated, avoiding the Neanderthal admixture that affected all the other ancestors of the Eurasians. And so while we have no actual physical remains, no archaeological record, scientists recognized basal Eurasians as critical to human prehistory. They were likely the earliest wave of humans to expand into Eurasia, or at least the first to branch off, leaving descendants that later mixed into populations across West Eurasia. The basal Eurasian hypothesis helps explain why some modern and ancient West Eurasian groups have noticeably less Neanderthal DNA than their eastern counterparts a clue that an early branch of humans stayed separate from Neanderthals entirely. So since this story started with the genetics, let's zoom in on this first. Based on DNA modeling studies, this lineage split off from other non-African humans at least 50,000 years ago, but quite possibly well before 60,000 years ago, with that upper end being 100,000, making them the first branch to break away after humans left Africa. While all other non-African humans carry Neanderthal-derived genetic fragments, that come to about 2% on average, basal Eurasians have essentially zero. This implies that Neanderthal human interbreeding events, which occurred roughly 50 to 60,000 years ago, mostly happened after basal Eurasians had already split off from the rest. Several genomic studies have detected the signature of basal Eurasian DNA in later peoples, which is how scientists know this ghost lineage existed. Lazaridis et al. in 2016 were examining genomes from the Near East and found that virtually all had a component of basal Eurasian ancestry. Epipaleolithic hunter-gatherers from the Levant, like the Natufians around 12,000 years ago, derived nearly half of their genome from basal Eurasians. I make it a point in tons of my other videos that when we have these admixture events, people's entire culture can change, but the DNA percentage change from these incoming people is only ever 10, maybe 20%. My go-to is the stress that it's never something like half. It's rare that we ever see this. We do get it with the Natufians over in Tafarol in North Africa, all the way over by Morocco. But also with the Natufians themselves, they are getting around half of their genome from basal Eurasians. Pre-pottery farmers of the Zagros Mountains in Iran carried even higher proportions, around 50 to 60%. And these findings confirm that basal Eurasians were not just a quirk of European farming populations. They were a pervasive element in the ancestral mix of the ancient Near East. And genetically, basal Eurasian ancestry acts almost like an anti-Neanderthal component, diluting the Neanderthal heritage in groups that possess it. And so aside from the Neanderthal question, they appear to have been fully modern humans like other Eurasians but likely sharing the long population bottleneck that all non-Africans experienced after leaving Africa. The founder's effect that when you take a subsection of a population, put it somewhere else, while well, the randomness in that group becomes the norm in that new group. Less genetic diversity the farther we get out of Africa. So that they share with the Eurasians, just no Neanderthal admixture. But the BE people would later become interwoven into the genomes of mostly West Eurasians. Now, there is this common misconception I used to have as well, but it's not that all Europeans and Asians come out of this group. They split off from the out-of-Africa shared base, and the basal Eurasian signal is found in Western Eurasia and North Africa, but not in populations that branched off eastward. East Asians, Siberians, Native Americans, Oceanans, 
And this is actually one reason why East Asians and Native Americans have higher Neanderthal ancestry than Europeans and Middle Easterners. They didn't experience the dilution effect from basal Eurasian admixture. That foundational paper on them showed that the Near Eastern populations had around 50% basal Eurasian, but that East Asians and Native Americans could be modeled without it. The basal group is separate from the non-basal, which itself would go on to mix with Neanderthal and Denisovan. Hopefully this visual helps with that. So now let's get to the theories on their homeland. One of the biggest mysteries about them is where they lived during this long separation. Some scientists think they could have originated in North Africa, north of the Saharan Desert. This idea gained traction after the discovery of the 15,000-year-old remains from Morocco, associated with the ibero marusian culture. It shows strong genetic link to ancient Near Easterners. Those Moroccan individuals had about two-thirds Eurasian ancestry, and that one-third African would later be identified as the Takakori people group. So be sure to check out the video up in the cards or down in the description. You'll see links to my video on this, the Green Sahara people, which really ends up being a fascinating full breakdown. But all this indicated a pre-agricultural connection between North Africa and Southwest Asia. One interpretation is that a basal Eurasian-like population was present in North Africa, and it makes a lot of sense that they could be from this area. Periodic Green Sahara climate phases could have opened habitable corridors across the desert, allowing early modern humans to move between Africa and the Levant. Then, of course, what you'll see on most maps, because it is central to that split towards the east and west, is their hypothesized home being in the Arabian Peninsula, particularly around the once exposed basin of the Persian Gulf. Genetic research on modern populations found that people in eastern Arabia today carry the highest levels of basal Eurasian ancestry of any group. Current day, it's still around 45%. And these Arabian genomes resemble those of ancient Ibero-Marusians, supporting the idea of a common source. Farira et al. in 2021 argued that the now-submerged Persian Gulf oasis could have been a safe haven for the basal Eurasians, a refuge where this group lived in relative isolation. Add on top of this that Neanderthal fossils and tools have never been found in southern Arabia. So it all suggests that if modern humans were in that region early on, they would not have encountered Neanderthals. Can't say for sure, obviously, but from the sheer volume of artifacts from other regions, from the Near East and into Europe, at the very least, it definitely does not seem like they had a strong presence in Southern Arabia. So when you put it all together, it does make a lot of sense. The Arabian Peninsula also had periods of milder, wetter climate in the past, potentially creating green landscapes for humans to inhabit. And in line with this, a newer 2024 study, by Valini et al., proposed that their homeland was in Arabia, and that Eurasia's population structure was once split between a southern Arabian branch, the Basil, and a northern branch, with an eventual meeting point in the Near East, specifically around the Iranian Plateau, described as a, quote, common Eurasian hub. So in the Arabian hypothesis, it's the idea that Basil Eurasians were an early group that lingered in southwest Asia, south of the Levant, largely isolated from Neanderthals, until later waves of humans arrived. It's also possible that basal Eurasians never went very far at all. They could have been an isolated subgroup within the broader Near East. And under this scenario, modern humans spreading out of Africa may have split, with one portion staying in a more southerly part of the Middle East, where Neanderthals were absent or at least scarce. Lazaridis et al. in that 2016 paper noted that the highest basal Eurasian fractions were found in ancient Near Easterners. Yet those same Near East regions are where Neanderthal interbreeding is said to have occurred. And so that seems to conflict. So one explanation is that the basal Eurasians sort of hug the periphery. They occupied a niche in the Near East and either actively avoided or just did not encounter Neanderthals. Whereas other branches of humans, the ancestors of everyone else, did encounter them in nearby areas. So in this view, they may have always been in greater West Asia, but sort of cordoned off from Neanderthal ranges maybe either through geography or climate, or just because they got there first and were able to hold it down, forcing later human groups to keep it moving, defending whatever territory they were on, which happened to not have Neanderthals, or they killed the Neanderthals that were there. All of these are plausible scenarios, but to be fair, they do seem pretty spread out, because one of the counter to the idea is that maybe they're just some Africa-connected population, not really of that main out-of-Africa group, I know it's confusing because literally they would be out of Africa, but what we mean when we say the OOA group is that around 60,000-year-old population, 
that would go on to populate the entire world if they weren't of that group, but did sort of flow out from around Egypt into the Levant and down into Arabia. That might seem plausible, but the biggest evidence against it is that basal Eurasian ancestry in the Levantine Natufians is no higher than in the Iranian groups. It appears that basal Eurasians were a widespread ghost population all across the Near East, rather than a singular tribe that was moving out to one region. But the key point here is that wherever they were, they remained genetically segregated enough to avoid Neanderthal gene flow. And so what researchers are hoping to do soon is to get more data from ancient human DNA from Arabia, Iran, and North Africa, which may finally pinpoint the true basal Eurasian homeland and finally resolve this debate. Of course, if that happens, I'll make a video on it as soon as possible. But of course, although they started off isolated, their legacy did not remain obscure. They ended up playing a major role in the genetic makeup of many later human populations. As the Ice Age waned and human groups became more mobile, Basal Eurasian ancestry mixed with other lineages, especially in West Asia. This was particularly consequential during the Neolithic period, the dawn of agriculture. When farming first arose in the Fertile Crescent, the early farmers themselves carried substantial Basal Eurasian heritage, which they then spread far and wide as agriculture expanded. Ancient DNA has revealed that all the primary Neolithic farming populations of the Near East had a significant Basal Eurasian component like how the first farmers of the Levant and Israel-Jordan region and the Zagros Mountains of Iran, around 10 to 12,000 years ago, derived roughly half of their ancestry from the BE stock. And slightly later, the Anatolian farmers in present-day Turkey, who would go on to introduce agriculture into Europe, also carried a considerable basal Eurasian fraction. Estimates range from about 30 up to 40 plus percent. In Europe, these Anatolian migrants, the early European farmers, intermixed with local hunter-gatherers, but still about a third of their genome was from the basal Eurasian lineage, according to that Lazaritis et al. 2014 paper. This means that the Neolithic Revolution didn't just spread new foods and lifestyles, but also spread basal Eurasian genes into new regions. And by the middle to late Neolithic, populations from the Atlantic coast of Europe to the Indus Valley in South Asia, they all harbored at least a trace of basal Eurasian ancestry, thanks to their Near Eastern farming ancestors. Then we have Upper Paleolithic remains from the Caucasus, with one example of a 25,000-year-old individual from Georgia, which had about 25% basal Eurasian ancestry, showing that gene flow from this lineage into other Western Eurasians began even before the Holocene. In North Africa, like I mentioned before, those 15,000-year-old Tafrol individuals from Morocco appear to be direct descendants of a basal Eurasian-related population that had migrated into Africa. Those Tafrol people were genetically closer to Near Easterners than to the distinct African population found at Takakori, which previously must have been spread all throughout North Africa. And so it all suggests that basal Eurasian descendants had via some route crossed the Sahara and contributed to North African gene pools by the late Pleistocene, likely up the African east coast, following the Nile up towards Egypt and then out west, and then across the entirety of the north. I wish there was more detail here, but this really is like Eurasian ghost DNA. Similar to what you see in Central Africa, the only thing we're working off of is DNA here. We can see the signatures of a population, but no archaeological sites. And just a recap of where they have the biggest impact on modern populations, Arabian people like the Bedouins and Yemenis, and to the lesser extent the Qataris and the other Gulf Arabs, they have the strongest basal Eurasian signal. With roughly 40-50% to 50 of their ancestry tracing back to this ancient source, and the Bedouin and Yemeni groups are even regarded as the closest living proxies for basal Eurasians, since they carry deeply divergent, quote, indigenous Arabian lineages, with relatively little outside admixture. Iranians and surrounding populations in the Caucasus and Near East are around 30 to 40 percent, and the Levantine peoples and really Eastern Mediterranean in general have something similar at about one third of their genes. North African Berber related groups have significant basal like ancestry as well, which might point to prehistoric back migrations from the Middle East. Meanwhile, most Europeans have a smaller percentage, more like 10 to 20 percent. Those southern Europeans, and those of course in the Mediterranean, tend to have the highest fractions, likely due to input from Neolithic farmers and later gene flow from the Near East. And from the big picture, it has shed light on the patterns of interbreeding between modern humans and Neanderthals. 
Researchers were always puzzled by the notable East-West difference. Present-day Europeans and Middle Easterners carry significantly less Neanderthal-derived DNA than East Asians do. Why would East Asians have about 20% more Neanderthal snippets? They're usually 23 to 2.4%, instead of the European average of just 2%. And in case you're wondering, no, this isn't just misidentified Denisovan admixture, because Asians also have more of that, too. And remember, it isn't because there's less Neanderthals in the West. It's just that the West had more dilution, more mixing with the basal Eurasians, who have 0%, bringing that average down. And it all is evidence toward the idea that the out of Africa expansions were not a single homogeneous wave, but instead included divergent branches that would stay separate for tens of thousands of years. This idea was revolutionary in 2014, when Lazaridis et al. showed that to properly model European ancestry, you have to include this basal Eurasian lineage split from other Eurasians. Once you include this ghost population into the model, it helped explain everything a lot better. And it helped fill in gaps in understanding why the European farmers were genetically distinct from the European hunter-gatherers. They had more of this BE admixture. I haven't seen this theory anywhere. Please comment your thoughts on it down below if there's something obvious I'm missing. But I wonder what their role is with the Sumerians. Their civilization erupts right where Iraq meets the Persian Gulf. This mysterious basal Eurasian people group were said to dwell in the Persian Gulf. When there was more land here, it wasn't as full as we see it on a map today. And the first Sumerian cities are very close to the coast, right near Arabia. And this entire region here has the strongest BE genetics even today. We don't have direct genomes of the people that would give rise to what we call Sumerians. The oldest genetic profiles we have say that they are something close to the Anatolian Neolithic farmers, with a mix of Iranian Plateau and the Zagros region. And these are three of the most influenced by the basal Eurasians as well. Again, with around a 50% mix. That level of admixture is so unique, the Sumerian profile is so mysterious, and this ghost DNA signature is such a mystery, that I just wonder if it's somehow related. Again, let me know what you think in the comments down below. Maybe I'll dive deeper into that in a future video. Subscribe so you don't miss anything. Please hit that like button. I really do need your help. And I'll see you in the next one.